for the blessing of the assembly. Good morning to everyone and a happy Feast of Tabernacles to all. Well, it has been our tradition and our custom here at the uh, Tagaytay Feast site, you know, uh, that we have the assembly, the blessing of the assembly. Well, the Lord, our God, gave Moses a specific instruction that whenever his chosen people, his treasured possession gathered together, that Aaron is supposed to bless them according to the words that God has given them. And we can read this in Numbers. Please turn your Bible to Numbers chapter 6 and in verse 22. So whenever there is an occasion like this, where the people are gathered together to worship, to honor God. And today is such a day. And this week is such a week. So we would like to do this blessing as we have done in a couple of years past. And in verse 22 we read, The Lord said to Moses, Tell Aaron and his sons, this is how you are to bless the Israelites, God's people, his very treasured possession, and today we are the spiritual Israelites. Say to them, the Lord bless you and give you, the Lord make his face shine upon you, and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. And the reason for this is that so that they will put my name on the Israelites, on God's people, putting God's name on His people, and God said, I will bless them. So, at this point, I uh, would like everyone to stand up for the blessing of the assembly. Let's bow our hands and pray. O oh God, our great eternal Father in heaven, your people have gathered today here in your presence in keeping with the commands, Father, that you have given us, that we come gathered together to rejoice and to celebrate your commanded feast of tabernacles, Father. Father, we gathered here in obedience to your words. Look down from heaven, your holy dwelling place, your throne of power and grace, and bless your people as you have promised. Now bless your people with the words that you have instructed your servants. Moses, to do, Father. So now, Father, bless your people with these words. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make His face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn His face toward you and give you peace. With much thanksgiving and joy, Father, in our hearts, we praise Your name today and forever. In the name of Your glorious Son, our King, our Savior, our coming brother, Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you very much, Mr. Winston Cole. I'll now turn over the mic. Mr. René Corpus to introduce our special guest and our speaker. Next.
Our guest speaker for this piece serves the Toledo, Ohio Church, but he also serves churches as far as 250 to 300 miles away from where he resides every Sabbath. That's about 400 kilometers, or if you are not familiar with distance, that's from Manila to Legazpi. He's been serving the Churches of God since the 1980s and was officially ordained into the ministry in 1996 by Mr. Garrett Ted Armstrong. He is a true elder of the church. In addition to regularly visiting churches, he also hosts the Armor of God television program. He is an electrician by profession, and at 75, he can easily outmoke and outdrive most of us, including me. Thanks to his mother's Cherokee blood and equally energetic wife, blessed with six children, 12 grandchildren, and eight great-grandchildren. Even though it is his first time to visit the Philippines, his father and brother, who served in the U.S. Navy and the U.S. Marines in World War II, were stationed for a brief time here in the Philippines to aid us in our war against the Japanese army. And now, he is here, serving as a spiritual soldier of God's army to support us win our war against spiritual forces of the adversary. Ladies, gentlemen, and brethren, I present to you Mr. Wayne Hendricks. Good morning, church. Good morning. Good morning. How wonderful it is to be here with you, finally for such a long time. One moment. Thank you. This little podium is going to be a challenge. <laughs> but I like a challenge. I bring you greetings from the United States and a very special greeting from Bill Watson and Jeff Reed who uh, were here uh, a year ago, and uh, they made sure that they wanted to uh, make it very personal. So, uh, last night, uh, I want to thank the Cole family for inviting us to uh, spend the evening with them, get to know them, and uh, the, the beauty of these surroundings is surpassed only by the beauty of the Filipino people. Sandy and I are just, we're so humbled by your warm hospitality. You're, you're, you're so gracious to us, and we appreciate it very, very much indeed. Thank you. Well, brethren, I want to ask a question. It has already been addressed in some respects, but I want to be very pointed. Why did you come here today? Why are you here? We're crying out loud on a Thursday? Are you kidding me? Why are we here on a Thursday? This is not Sunday. It's not even a seven-day Sabbath day. It's a Thursday. And isn't it so that we stick out like a sore thumb in this world? Isn't it so that we're, well, we're oddballs, aren't we? You know what an oddball is. You, know? you ever hear the term about square people trying to fit in round holes or vice versa. It just doesn't work, does it? But I've got this theory about God's people that, that most of us, if not all of us, all through our lives we've been aware that we were indeed square pegs that didn't fit into the round holes of this world. And I've got this, it's a Wayne Hendricks theory, but I believe that God has been drawing us and dealing with us uh, far longer than most of us realize. And, and I think that we all have a sense of awareness that we're not part of this world, and that God has called us for something special, something special indeed. And uh, 
to, to, to highlight that, I want to begin today by turning over to the book of 1 Corinthians. The book of 1 Corinthians. I want to illustrate something that, if I can find room here, that's very important to us because you are indeed special. Now God's word refers to us as peculiar people. We are indeed. We've been called for a special calling. And here in 1 Corinthians, I want to break into the text of 1 Corinthians at verse 26. Well, let me back up to verse 25. Because what we're doing is indeed foolishness to the world. The foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. Now, we need not understand that as aspects of God's character. These words have a meaning, and uh, I think it's very important for us sometimes to delve into the uh, Greek language for the nuance of understanding that it can provide for us. I've said on many occasions that it wasn't by accident that God chose the Greek language, which was the most intellectual language extant in the world at that time, that had uh, a, a, a grammar that would allow for the nuance of understanding to be captured. And it didn't happen by chance. God knew what he was doing. And many of these words uh, need further expounding because we must always remember that the, the translators of the Greek and the Hebrew, and the Aramaic and the Latin that we now call the Bible, primarily the King James Bible for the most part, the Geneva Bible before that, the Bishop's Bible before that, the Great Bible before that. All of these Bibles were translated by individuals. God led that work, no doubt. He motivated them to do it. He oversaw it in many respects, but nevertheless, we must always remember that the translators of the Bible, Tyndale, Wycliffe, all of them, they were affected by their own religious paradigm. They were affected by their own educational background. And that educational background, in every case without exception, was the Church of Rome. And this is not a personal indictment against Roman Catholic people. Um, many members of my family are Roman Catholic. My wife was Roman Catholic. Wonderful people. And isn't it true that we all know Sunday keeping Christians Roman Catholics and Protestants as well, that in many respects can put some of God's people to shame in the Christian charity that they show. Isn't that so, brethren? Somebody say amen. amen. Indeed, that is the case. So it's, it's not about people, but it is about the errors that have been laid upon people down through the centuries. And so it's important for us to sometimes make the distinction about what some of these words mean. It's very important for us here. The foolishness of God. The foolishness here, the word is morologe, and it literally means that which is perceived to be illogical, that which is perceived by someone to be illogical or nonsensical. It's the perspective being referenced here by Paul of, of the opinion that people have about us and these things of God that they do not understand. And it talks about the weakness of God being stronger than that of men. And the word weakness is as thin as he, and it literally means the smallest or most minute detail, the most minor detail. And so the most minor detail of God is greater than men. That's what's really being referenced in the fullness of what God was saying through the Apostle Paul. But I wanted to draw our attention to this because it's very important. Verse 26, or verse 27 rather, God has not has chosen indeed the foolish things of the world. That, that's us, the simple people of the world who are not understood. And isn't it so that our friends and neighbors, and especially in many cases our families, think that what we're doing here today is illogical? It makes no sense. Isn't it so? I remember when I was called to the truth, and uh, when I began to keep the Sabbath, and my mother 
Eleanor was worried about me. She thought I had lost my mind. And, and so I had a very esteemed uh, Baptist uncle who was quite famous as a, as a preacher, as a minister. And uh, so she called him to come and get me straightened out, as it were. To get this nonsense about going to church on Saturday out of my head and, and get me back in the fold, so to speak. You know. And I remember that very vividly. And I remember his words about me being a fool. You're just, you're just being foolish. This is foolishness. This is nonsense. Don't you know that all of that has been done away? And so we sat at my mother's kitchen table for about three hours. Now, he was a man of some years, close to 60 years old, and I was a youth of 20. And he had many credentials behind his name. He, was, he had the doctorate of theology from the Baptist seminary. And he was the author of books, and he had been on the radio. He was quite famous. As a matter of fact, when he passed away, 47 Baptist preachers from all over the United States came to carry his casket and to preach his funeral. And so he was a, a man very well esteemed in traditional Christian circles. And he was going to straighten me out. And so we sat there for three hours. He didn't, even, he didn't even deign to open up a Bible because, after all, he knew it all. But you see, I had God's Word in front of me as a 20-year-old, and all I could do was look at the Bible and see what it had to say. And at the end of our discussion, he got very angry and said, finally, well, everything you've said is correct, but nevertheless, I've got a thousand people in church every Sunday, and I'm going to be there to preach to them. So, so that was the end of our discussion. But the point is, we've all had some kind of similar experience where someone tried to straighten us out or tell us how foolish we were. Isn't that so? Indeed it is. And, and how is it that you can share the truth that lights you up and motivates you and expound it to other people, and they just don't get it? In the States, we have this phrase, when someone doesn't get it, we call it the deer in the headlight book. You know, at night, if you're driving along, and, and the deer will come across the road, and he'll stop, and he'll just stare at you. Yes. They don't get it. They don't understand what we're doing. We're here today because we perceive that God has indeed commanded us to be here. We get it. We understand that we are obliged to be obedient to the commands of our God. And that Christianity is not just making it up as you go along. It's not what some church organization says it is. It's not what some seminary teaches. It's what's in this holy inspired word of God. And we are obliged to follow it. I salute you, brethren. I commend you, Filipino brethren, for being here today. For being the oddballs that you are. And I love you because of this. We are indeed brothers and sisters in Christ. My sermon is taking on a life of its own already. And I'm forgetting my notes. It's already been referenced, especially in the, in the beautiful blessing, the ceremony of the blessing, that, that we are uniquely Israelites. Isn't that somewhat ironic in light of the fact that we certainly cannot claim a genetic connection necessarily to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Although in many cases, that what may not be apparent, it, it is there. You know, genetic testing can sometimes surprise us. But the fact is, brethren, we are indeed Israelites. And I'm glad that was pointed out. Very, very important. Because I remember one of the arguments against us doing this is that well, we're not Israelites, we're Gentiles. This was specifically, we had specific language this morning that talked about Israel and the Israelites. And yet, it's because they did not understand. We've been called. Do you see your calling, brethren? Verse 25, because the foolishness of God is wiser than men and the weakness of God is stronger than men. For you see your calling. We see it, brethren. How that many not wise are called, after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called, but God has chosen the foolish things of the world. 
we have been chosen. And as I read that, I, re I recall that the Lord Jesus Christ said to his disciples, you have not chosen me, I have chosen you. Isn't that remarkable? That out of all the brilliant people on this planet, people with degrees, people with IQs that are so high, and yet he has called you and he has called me. And he had something in mind when he called us. And I always like to talk about this because I believe it's comforting. And we're told to rejoice. And I don't think you can truly rejoice, rejoice and have the, the rejoicing of the spirit, the, the joy of salvation that this book talks about, unless you understand certain fundamental things. When God called you, first of all, I'm getting ahead of myself. How many here, is, how many are here for the first feast? Your very first feast? I salute you. God bless you for being here. Yes. How many here are baptized members of God's church? <laughs> Brethren, we have indeed received a calling, and the, the calling has to do indeed with the indwelling of God's Holy Spirit. Turn the page with me in your Bibles over to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. We have been given insight and understanding. The mysturion of God, you know what that word is, mysturion? It is the Greek word that means, essentially it means mystery. The things that have not been understood. The things that a lot of low-meaning people have not understood. Because it cannot be understood unless God Almighty the Father personally turns that light on for you. It requires literally an interaction with God the Father, the sovereign God that was already referenced today. He must focus on you, he must think about you, he must look at you, he must be aware of you, he must know you, he must look at the clay and determine that it's ready for molding. He has to do that and then begin to draw you to him and call you. And when he did that, he's not a God of doubt, he knew what he was doing, he called you because Almighty Sovereign God in his perfect mind had already determined that you can do it. Otherwise, he would not have called you because he's not a God of doubt. He called you because he had already looked into your life, into the very DNA. He had looked into every crevice of your life. Everything that has ever happened to you is known of God. All that has molded you and shaped you is known of God. And he has considered it, he has looked at you, and he has made the determination to call you. That's remarkable. And it's comforting to know that almighty, sovereign God entertained the thought of Wayne, entertained the thought of Sandy, entertained the thought of Renee, entertained the thought of every one of us in a very special way and looked at us and began to draw us because he saw things in us that perhaps others could not see, that we could not even see about ourselves. And he decided to draw us. I can use this one. I can mold this one. I can make something out of this one. I can use this one. This one will be faithful to me. This one can handle the truth. I can give them something and they won't waste it. Yes. And so he began to draw us and deal with us. And here in chapter 2 of 1 Corinthians, we begin to get the understanding. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, Brethren, I came to you not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God, for I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling, and my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power, that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. And indeed it is, brethren. Howbeit, we speak wisdom among them that are perfect, yet not the wisdom of this world, nor of the princes of this world that come to naught. Yes, we speak it, they don't get it, but you do. We speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, a mysterion, even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world. And I'll have more to say about that in other sermons, but this word world here is not cosmos, 
It is aion, and the construction of this sentence in the Greek makes it clear that it's talking about before the beginning of time. That will be critical to a future sermon. Before the beginning of time, God had ordained our glory that none of the princes of this world knew, verse 8, for they, had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But, as it is written, I has not seen nor ear heard, neither has entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for them that love him. The world doesn't get it. That's reaffirmation of what I've been saying. They do not get it, brethren. They don't understand it. But you do. But God has revealed them unto us by His Spirit. We get it. We understand it. It's been open to us. For the Spirit searches all things, yea, the deep things of God. For what man knows the things of a man, save the spirit of man which is in him? Yes, we have a spiritual element added to us. A, a spirit quality that God has given us that raises us above the animal level. You know, there are some animals, some few animals on planet Earth, who actually have brains, the gray matter of the, the, the brain orbit is actually superior in some dolphins. And it is superior in Asian elephants, for instance. It is superior in some animals. There's actually more of it in some animals. With more nerve connections going to it and more synapses firing in it. And yet, they're nowhere near our level because a spirit has been added to us. And I won't turn there for time, but in Zechariah chapter 12, it talks about the fact that God formed the spirit of man that is in us. And the word formed there is the same word that is used in the creation epic for Adam. And it is the word that means created with artistic expression with create uh, artistic expression, with yatsar, artistic expression, God has molded and shaped the spirit of man, designed the spirit of man that he wants us to have that will fit our physiognomy and fit his vision for us and what he wants it to do for us. And he has given us that spiritual element, which is not the man, but a power to the man and to this gray matter that lifts us up above the animals and gives us cognitive ability and makes us most specifically like God in image and likeness in this physical form that we inhabit. And it is because of that that we can know the things that we know. That's what this scripture is about. God has revealed them unto us by His Spirit, for the Spirit searches all things, yea, the deep things of God. For what man knows the things of a man, save the spirit of man which is in him. Yes, we know about the things associated with man because we have that intellectual capacity through that spirit. Even so, the things of God knows no man but the spirit of God. Now, we have received not the spirit of the world, not the spirit of Omnirius Numa, of the evil spirit that is in the world, but the spirit which is of God, the Hagion Numa, the Holy Spirit of God, that we might know the things that are freely given unto us by God, which things we speak not in the words of man's wisdom, but with the Holy Spirit we teach, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. But the natural man receives not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are indeed foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. That's why they don't get it. That's why your eloquence in explaining it doesn't get through to them. It must be a divine thing. God the Father must be involved. But the natural man receives not the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. But he that is spiritual judges all things, yet he himself is judged of no man. For who has known the mind of the Lord, that he may instruct him? But this is a very key scripture. But we have the mind of Christ. And that's what conversion is all about. It has begun in us. How many will raise your hand today and tell me that you know that God has called you and that Jesus Christ and your Father are dealing with you and that change has happened to you and that you're not the same? How many will tell me that today? Is he dealing with you? Has he called you? Is there a difference in your life 
You can never be the same. Something has happened to you now that is immutable, that must have a conclusion. God has begun to deal with you and to draw you and to empower you and to give you a, a capacity for an expanded heart and an expanded intellect and the ability to absorb what he has for you. How, how unique we are, how blessed we are indeed, friend. Now if you will, I've said all of that to say what I want to say over in Leviticus chapter 23. <laughs> that was a long way around, wasn't it? I feel very strongly that it's imperative on the holy days to do what we're told to do here in Leviticus chapter 23 and in Deuteronomy and other places as well and in Numbers as has been referenced. But we are given very specific instructions here that require, I believe, require of us to be very specific and pointed on the holy days to validate their authenticity and to validate why we're doing it. And in Leviticus chapter 23, let me break into the text at verse 1 of chapter 23, because no matter how many times we've heard it preached, this is very important that we understand this. The Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and say unto them, Concerning the feasts of the Lord, which you shall proclaim to be holy convocations, even these are the feasts of the Jews. Wait a minute. It doesn't say that, does it? No. These are my feasts. See, this is personal with God. These are his feasts. The feasts did not originate out of the traditions of Israel. The, the feasts, the holy days, the Sabbath, and the feasts, they did not originate out of an accumulation over generations of human wisdom and philosophy. They did not originate out of the fact that Israel was a, was a, a, a growing culture where they sowed crops and planted. It was not because of their agriculture, although God has very ingeniously tied it to their growing season and the harvest season. But, but that's not how the holy days were founded. They were founded in the mind of man before man existed. In other sermons yet to come, I'm going to point some things out about that. Before sin happened, before the world was, before time began, the concept of the holy days and the Sabbath had already percolated in the mind of God because the plan of salvation existed in God's mind, complete and full, with no codicils hanging unattached anywhere before he started the plan. But here in Leviticus chapter 23, the word feasts here, concerning the feasts of the Lord, has it been preached to you that this word literally means the appointed times, the appointed place, the appointed thoughts of God? The word is moedim, that is the plural for moab, which is the appointments of God, the appointed things of God, things that God has appointed. We are here today to answer my question because we're keeping the appointment. God has made an appointment with us. And the Sabbath and the holy days have holiness in them. It isn't for not that he calls them holy. It's the holy Sabbath and the holy days. God is in them in ways that he's not in other days. He's in them. His presence is in them. His mind is in them. His inspiration is in them. When we have the presence of mind to be, be obedient to him and be there on the Sabbath and the holy days, God has something for If we will keep the appointment, because God keeps the appointment and he can teach us in spectacular ways on the Sabbath and the holy days that nothing else can accomplish. No eloquence can get through to us in the same way that the Sabbath and the holy days can when we are obedient to them and we preach the truths of them. He's got something for us. He had this all figured out. It is the appointed time, the appointed place, the appointed event, the appointed wisdom of God. It is the Moedims of God, His appointments, that are commanded to us. He planned it and thought it out before time began because it was a motivation of His love. I won't just create them and set them down there and let them go to start <coughs> through life. I will give them a directive. I will give them things to do. I will teach them how to be like me. I will give them the Sabbath and the holy days to teach them in ways that 
otherwise cannot be accomplished. I will put my presence in the Sabbath and the holy days, and if they will be there to keep the appointment, I can embrace them in ways that otherwise they could not experience. Yes, God knew what he was doing. The Sabbath and the holy days are teaching vehicles. They are mechanisms from God to get through to this gray matter in ways that otherwise would not be accomplished. It is the genius of our God. It is the brilliance of our God. He didn't give them to us just as hoops to make us jump through. He gave them to us for what it can accomplish for us. And he goes on here to enumerate all of them, including the Sabbath, to make us understand that they are commanded assemblies. It's not left up to us. I remember some years ago, maybe 30 years ago, I was at the Feast of Tabernacles, and I almost fell out of my chair when the person speaking said, really the only two days required at the feast are the high days. And I, I was tempted to stand up and, and, and interrupt. That wouldn't have been the right thing to do. Sandy poked me in the ribs and said, sit down, be quiet, be quiet. <laughs> but the fact is, it is for seven days, and the eighth day, it's all the Feast of Tabernacles, thing. Not, not just the high days, of course. And it's very, very important that we understand these things, that it is a convoked assembly, and certain things are required of us because God has something for us, and if we don't do it His way, guess what? He has the prerogative. <laughs> there He is. And so when we will do it His way, He can interact with us. Our obedience engages Him. Our obedience literally obliges Him. And then He interacts with us in ways that otherwise we could not and of course, it's all also a matter of our attitude and our humility and our eagerness. If you hunger for it, he is gracious to give it. Yes. And it's important that we understand some of these words. We are here in a convoked assembly. <coughs> Webster's New Collegiate Dictionary defines a convocation this way. To convoke literally means to demand one's presence. How about that? To demand one's presence, a convoked assembly is a is a convoked a convoked or commanded convocation is a convoked assembly, as it were. Yes, indeed. And on each of the holy days, on each of the Sabbath and holy days, they are to be expounded. They are to be talked about. They are to be kara. The word is kara, and it means to speak expressly to them. It means to preach them out. It means to talk about them. It means to validate them. And we are obliged to do that. And that's what we're doing right now. Kara in this context, in this grammatical construction, is a reference not only to the preaching of the, these facts associated with each holy day, but also to the announcement of the event itself, which was done, of course, in each instance by the blowing of trumpets. This was so important to God that he, that he created it and instigated the blowing of trumpets throughout the land. Not just on the Feast of Trumpets, but did you know that on the Sabbath and all of the holy days, the trumpet was started at the temple and then reverberated in every synagogue throughout the land. So that at one point, there was a constant sound of the shofar and of the trumpet that filled the entire land of Israel with the sound of that, of that trumpet that even exceeded the borders of the trumpet on the Sabbath and the holy days. The call to the appointment. Come, keep the appointment. That's what God has said to us and demanded of us. So we have been called to keep these appointments. And uh, I'm very glad that it was also pointed out already that there are specific things associated with this that we are to do, not the least of which is to rejoice. Our attitude is of great importance. You shall rejoice before the eternal your God seven days, it says in verse 40 of Leviticus 23. To rejoice is, the word is saw mak, saw mak. And it literally means to be filled with laughter, to be filled with mirth, to be jubilant, to be overjoyed, to have a smiling face, to be bright, to be sunny, to have a sunny countenance, to have a glad countenance, to be glad, to be blissful, to be cheerful, 
All of those definitions apply in various Hebrew grammatical sentences. Samak, to have a smiling face, to be joyful, to truly rejoice. And that can only come from the heart. And when it's in the heart, you can't hide it. It'll be there on your face. Let's smile at each other through this feast. Let's, let's be authentic in our, in our joy and our appreciation and our love. Let's appreciate how unique we are in the world. Isn't the relationship that we have precious to us? How few we are in numbers? Yes. And isn't it wonderful to dwell with God's people together? People who know what you know, people who believe the wonderful things that you believe, people who have been given the light like you have. It's, it's good for us, isn't it? It's like medicine, yes indeed. On the Sabbath and the Holy Days, I can hardly wait to be there. Yes. I give a sermon on average 60 times a year. 52 Sabbaths and then the Holy Days. And I've been doing that for 30 years. But I'm not tired. I can't wait to get there. I'm always anxious. And I find it difficult to understand, in fact, I don't understand how someone can, well, can have a cavalier attitude about attendance. When God has something for us, when we keep the appointment, how important that is, and how a blessing it is for me and for you by virtue of the fact that we're vessels of God's Spirit. Your spirit comforts me. The, the spirit of God in you comforts me. And, and my spirit in you can in me can comfort you. We, we are a medicine to each other. God understood that in the designing of the whole plan. Our bodies work on a circadian rhythm based upon seven and multiples of seven. The universe works on multiples of seven. And so do our bodies and so do the holy days. And God knows that we need each other. We need, the, we need the strength that we can get from each other. We need the comfort that we can get from each other. And isn't it so that sometimes the pain in one's life can only be assuaged by a brother or sister who can be there for you to put their arms around you and say, there now, yes, I understand. Yes. Have we ever been that way? Have we ever needed that? Yes. I need some of that today. Anybody, any volunteers? I'm, I'm looking forward to that. I'm telling you, I want some hugs, okay? <laughs> if, I, if I wasn't clear enough, let me be clear. You know. I'm open to being hugged. Yes, indeed. So, brethren, we have a wonderful calling. But there's something I wanted to point out to you about the Sabbath and the Holy Days. All of them. Because in each and every one of them, there is a thought process required of us, something that we are to remember and bring to the forefront of our minds. We are to memorialize certain things. All of them have the aspect of memorialization, of bringing to mind certain things, certain points of truth, certain scriptural references even. And in each of the Sabbaths, each of the annual Sabbaths and the weekly Sabbath, something is required of us and this is something that is not generally known even amongst many of God's people, that on each Sabbath and each holy day, we are to think of it in terms of Jesus Christ's salvific efforts on our behalf. Because it is indeed about that. It's about the salvation of our Lord Jesus Christ and what he has done for us. On the Sabbath and all of the holy days, there are numerous scriptures, and I'm just going to reference a very few of them, that require of us to think about the fact that we have been freed from bondage. We have been brought out from the slavery of sin. We have been freed by the strong hands and stretched out arms of our Savior. And that shouldn't go by us without realizing the symbology. And it's talking about the fact that we were slaves to the Pharaoh of this world, Satan the devil. We were slaves in this Egypt that we all live in. And now we, like the children of Israel before us, have been freed. We have been brought out with strong hands and stretched out arms. And we are to remember that. Turn with me in your Bibles to Deuteronomy chapter 5. Deuteronomy chapter 5 is a reiteration of 
Exodus chapter 20, where we are given the Ten Commandments. But in Deuteronomy chapter 5, there is some extra detail in regards to the Sabbath. And I remember when that epiphany happened for me. You know what, what the word epiphany is? It means like when a light comes on, when, when all of a sudden, wow, oh yes, I get it, yes. And I, I had read this countless times, but sometimes we can go over a scripture many times, and then all of a sudden, we'll read it again, our perseverance will pay off, and boom, a light will come on. Or perhaps it will be preached for the umpteenth time, and then boom, a light will come on. Yes. And that's, that's an indication that God has decided, well, okay, now he can handle this, this piece of truth as well. Boom, here it is, and a light comes on for you, yes. Here in Deuteronomy chapter five, we're told that we are to keep the Sabbath, to remember the Sabbath day, to keep it holy. And we're not given a lot of instruction about how that is to be done, other than we are not to do any servile work. But this applies to the Sabbath and all of the holy days, and like I said, I won't take time to go through all of the scripture that make that clear, but here in Deuteronomy chapter 5, and a few other places, uh, it talks about the Sabbath, verse uh, 13. Six days shall you labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the eternal your God, and it you shall not do any work, you nor your son nor your daughter, nor your manservant nor your maidservant nor your ox nor your ass, nor any of thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates, that thy manservant and thy maidservant may rest as well as thee, all within your control, all within your authority. And then verse 15. And remember that you were a servant in the land of Egypt. Remember that you were lost in sin. Remember that you could not save yourself. The children of Israel couldn't save themselves. For 430 years, they were slaves. They couldn't save, save themselves. But they were brought out with the strong hands and stretched out arms of their God. Remember that you were a sinner. Remember that you were lost in sin. Remember that you had a date with the wages of sin. Remember that you were a servant in the land of Egypt and that the Lord thy God brought thee out thence through a mighty hand and by a stretched out arm. Therefore the Lord thy God commanded thee to keep the Sabbath day. You, did you hear that? Did you get that? We are to keep the Sabbath day expressly for this reason. Now it was given to us at creation, but God is tying something to it here that we have not perhaps previously understood. We keep the Sabbath because of salvation. We keep the Sabbath because the Lord thy God commanded thee to keep the Sabbath day because we are to remember that we have been freed. The bondage of sin has been broken. We're the, the, the Pharaoh of this world no longer has a hold of us. We're not his slaves anymore. We have been freed. And you will find similar scriptures, similar words associated with each of the holy days, and over and over and over again to the point of redundancy, and I don't say that disrespectfully, I say it simply because grammatically God is literally redundant in telling us this because he wants us to get it. That we are to remember this fact, to remember that you've been freed, to remember that you've been saved, to remember that the strong hands and stretched out arms of your Lord has brought you out. Verse 4 of chapter 6. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might, and these words which I command you this day shall be in your heart. And then over in verse 20, again we see a reiteration, because when the children of the of the Israelites were growing up they were instructed as to why it all had happened when your son or your daughter would ask you in time to come saying what means the testimonies and the statutes and the judgments which the eternal our God has commanded you now the testimonies the statutes and the judgments that's all inclusive that's the Bible that is the Word of God in total then you shall say unto thy son 
We were Pharaoh's bondmen. We were lost in sin. We were slaves in Egypt. And the Eternal brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand. That is important understanding that we are to memorialize in the Feast of Tabernacles and on every Sabbath day, really. It is very, very important that we remember that and never forget it. Now, if you would, turn with me in your Bibles over to the book of Zechariah. Why is it that God wants the world to keep the Feast of Tabernacles? And why is that commanded? For the same, very same reasons that it is commanded for us. Because it is a teaching mechanism. It is a, a means whereby God can keep an appointment with mankind. And in the future, when mankind keeps that appointment, it will begin to change the world. Is anybody here happy with the way the world is right now? Does the world need to be changed? Uh, okay, let's see. What do you know, students of God's Word? When Christ returns, what is the world going to be like? Well, it's going to be utter devastation. You know, there are scriptures in Daniel and in the book of Revelation that give a pretty strong indication, a strong possibility, that when Christ returns, there will only be a tithe of humanity left, and the world is going to need the Feast of Tabernacles. The world is going to need the Sabbath. A, a staggering, broken, suffering humanity who all, who all, whatever number is left, are going to need what the Sabbath and the Holy Days can do for us. And that's why God has commanded it. And when people begin to obey, begin to do it, it will change the world. And here in Zechariah 14, I wanted to point out to you that in the end time, when Christ has returned, he will make it an appointment. It shall come to pass, verse 16, that everyone that is left of all the nations which came against Jerusalem shall even go up from year to year to worship the King, the Lord of hosts, and to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. Did you notice that it said, of all that were left, clearly indicating a, a correlation with other scriptures that talk about things that are going to happen. There will be entire populations entire ethnicities. There will be entire language groups that will no longer exist. There will be just certain small numbers of people left. Of all that is left, because the nations are going to come against him at his return, and they will suffer a great consequence for that. And then they will come up in their time of resurrection. But of all that are left, they shall go from year to year to worship the King, the Lord of hosts, and to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. And guess what? It's going to be a command that will be enforced, and there will be a consequence for those who will not do it. For those who will not do it, they won't have good crops. There will be a problem with the rain, and, and nothing will be right for them. And the God who controls the weather will cause no rain to fall upon them. It shall be that Whoso will not come up of all the families of the earth unto Jerusalem to worship the King, the Lord of hosts, even upon them shall be no rain. And if the family of Egypt go not up and come not to have no rain, there shall be the plague, wherewith the Lord will smite the heathen that come not up to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. Oh, it's very important to God. He's going to keep that appointment with humanity. Verse 19. They shall be the punishment of Egypt and the punishment of all nations that come not up to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. If they do not keep the Feast of Tabernacles. And so, brethren, at the beginning of the millennial reign of Jesus Christ, it will have to be enforced. But because it will be enforced, and because people will do it, it will change the world. And people will then be eager to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. And force will not be necessary. And I want to close with you today over in Isaiah.
if you're not happy with the world, and I am not, because it looks like the world is getting ready to have another great disaster. I wonder how many people down through the ages have died in wars. How many, how many hundreds of millions have suffered and died as a result of war? I take no pleasure in reporting this to you, brethren, but between now and the Battle of Armageddon, the Bible allows for the possibility of all kinds of wars, including another world war that could very well happen even before the Battle of Armageddon. Yes. No weapon that has ever been invented that hasn't been used. And I, I, I take no pleasure in reporting that thermonuclear warfare is in mankind's future. Yes. Because some of the prophecies in the book of Daniel, in the book of Revelation, simply could not happen otherwise. Yes. So these, these scriptures are very, very important. We are going to be empowered with the ability to change man, to change hearts, to change this world. In Isaiah chapter 2, as a result of the fact that the Lord Jesus Christ is indeed going to return, he is indeed going to establish his Father's kingdom, and we are indeed going to meet him in the air, proceed with him to the Mount of Olives, it shall come to pass in the last days that the mountain, the har is the Hebrew word, and it's used here in numerous other places to mean the governments, the government, the head of government, the seat of power, it shall come to pass in the last days that the seat of power, the government, the mountain of the eternal's house shall be established in the top of the mountains, in the top of all the seats of government, in the top of all the power, the most powerful will be there, and it shall be exalted above the hills, and all the nations shall flow into it. And many people shall go and say, come ye, let us go up to the house of the mountain of the eternal, to the house of the God of Jacob, and he will teach us of his ways. For Mohammed has failed us. Kali has failed us. Yes, Hinduism has failed us. Islam has failed us. Let us go up to the house of the eternal, and he will teach us of his ways, and we will walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the eternal from Jerusalem. And that law will transform planet Earth. For the first time, men will be transformative. And the spirit of rebellion will no longer be extant on planet Earth. The Bonerius Numa that is currently here, that affects all of us, and that has affected every human being from Adam right up to the present time, will no longer be extant. And the spirit of the eternal will be poured out like water so that it covers the earth like the seas now cover the earth. And the evil spirit, the punerius pneuma, that is now extant in the world will be displaced and replaced with holy spirit. And it will be extant in the world. And it will change the very character and nature of man. We will no lo man will no longer have a carnal nature. Man's very nature will change because the carnal human nature that mankind now has does not come from God. There's nothing about it closely related to God. It is all a reflection of the God of this world, Satan the devil, who is indeed filled with avarice, lust, hate, greed, spite, envy, malice, jealousy. None of those are attributes of God. When Holy Spirit replaces evil spirit, those attributes will be extant in the very environment. And it will change this planet. It will change the animals. It will change the agriculture. And it will change man. And for the first time, man will finally stand up to be. See, do I look noble when I do this? <laughs> God created man to be noble, 
and man will finally meet the image that God had. All that God was thinking when he said, let us make man in our image and our likeness. Man will finally rise to all that man can be. That's the vision. And that's the future. And the law will go forth out of Zion and the word of the eternal from Jerusalem. And he shall judge among the nations and shall rebuke many people. They shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. O house of Jacob, which you are, O house of Jacob, come ye and let us walk in the light of the Lord. And for the last several minutes, we have been doing just that, brethren. Thank you for inviting Sandy and I to be here with you for the Feast of Tabernacles. God bless you, my brothers and sisters, and I'll be back up here in a few days. Yes, thank you.